Hi, I'm Sarah Kavanaugh, and this is Peaceful Exit. Every episode, we explore death, dying, and grief through stories by authors familiar with the topic. Writers are our translators. They take what is inexpressible, impossible to explain, and they translate it into words on a page. My guests today are Don Rosenstein and Justin Yap. They are both psychiatrists at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Several years ago, they started a support group for local widowed fathers of young kids whose partners had died from cancer. It was a rich experience for them. It created a lot of meaning and connection for the men involved and for Don and Justin. Their book, The Group, Seven Widowed Fathers Reimagine Life, details everything from how the group got started, how it evolved over time, the conversations that these guys had with each other, their big and small victories and struggles. They were grieving and they were trying to parent at the same time. I love this book for so many reasons. If you're a widowed parent, you might feel less alone. If you have a friend or family member who's a widowed parent, you're going to get a deeper understanding of the unique challenges they are facing. If you run a small group cohort of any kind, like I do, we even dive into group dynamics. It's fascinating. As hosts of the group, Don and Justin share insights about grief that are relevant to a wide audience. Welcome to Peaceful Exit. How did this come about? You wrote this book. Um, How did this group start? So uh, Don and I each work at a cancer hospital, UNC Cancer Hospital, and I'm a psychologist on psychiatrist. And it was a little over 13 uh, years now. It just so happened that I was working, you know, we work primarily with patients who have cancer, of course, and I was working with several relatively young women who were all married and all had children at home. And sadly, around the same time, not too far from each other, these three women died from their cancer. So I had known them and and Don as well. And we were talking about it in one of our clinical rounds where we have time where we talk about difficult or challenging cases and kind of support each other and got talking about these. And Don said, you know what, you should look for some kind of support group for their husbands because I can't imagine what they're going through, just having lost their wives and raising kids at home. I thought, yeah, it's a great idea. And so I went back and looked for a support group to refer them to found that there was nothing, not only really in our area, in North Carolina, but as far as I could tell, as far as I could find online anywhere else either. And so Don and I thought, well, there's no way to refer these guys. This seems to be a need that we could maybe start to fill. Why don't we start a support group? And so we did. And we thought we knew what we were doing maybe back then. We, yeah, we, we even planned for it to be a six session meeting, get these guys together break it up to where we would kind of do a little psychoeducation at the beginning and then save some time for group discussion. And by the end of that first meeting with these uh, incredible seven guys, we were disabused of the notion that we had as much to teach them as they had to contribute to each other. And so moving forward, we scrapped the plan of psychoeducation, turned it into all kind of group discussion where we gave the onus of what was going to be discussed to the men that they would bring to the table what felt most important to them. And one of the guys said, you know, if this happens to work and this is important and helpful, why are you guys limiting it just to six sessions? And we didn't have a good answer. And so we said, well, let's just keep it open and open it up. And we did. And that group of men met together for just about four years. That's incredible. And I really admire the fact that when you did gather them, that you let them sort of set the agenda versus, you know, you had your plan, but they obviously needed something different and you were open to that. I think from the outside, if you're not living this experience, it can be hard to know what to do or say. I appreciate that the details you share in this book really give me some insight into the nuance of their grief. A cope what comes through in the book is that organizing, consolidating theme which is about essentially reimagining a future that you thought you had and then you didn't have. For me, when it started feeling more generalizable happened one night when, for whatever reasons, the conversation in the group went in a direction of, in a sense, mourning something that you lost but that you never really had in the first place, which is your future. And I shared a story about being the father of a son with 
autism. And part of the story was that I went through a process when my son was first diagnosed with severe autism, where I had to mourn this imagined future that I was going to have with my son. I never had it. It was never promised to me, but I was still anticipating it. And so if, if there's a core theme that we tried to capture in the book, it's just that, which is all of us have this picture of how our life is going to go. It's like when you miss the last step on a flight of stairs, you're expecting it's not there or what a jolt it is because you're acting as though it's going to be there. And so I think that was um, what we tried to capture because all of these guys were in the process of putting together a new version of what they thought their life was going to look like. And at the same time, they were mourning what they had had, what they had lost. Yeah. Yeah. So as a mom, I can't imagine what it felt like to feel like the wrong parent died. And your fathers, I'm a mother. How does that resonate with you as fathers? It was what one of the fathers in the group, Neil, said that in one of our meetings. And he didn't say it as to shock anyone or to be provocative in any way. It was almost just a comment he made, like he assumed everyone felt that way because to his mind at that point, newly widowed, his wife held a much more important place in their family's life and especially the kids' lives than he did. And he felt as far as the kids were concerned, the role of parent died, right? That they would have been better off with a surviving mother than with a surviving father. And there was actually some discussion and even debate about that in the group that night, which was great. You know, showing that these guys weren't just in lockstep at every point of the way, right? A couple other fathers said that's... Now, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, hold on. That's that's not the way I would look at it. That's not the way I've been looking at it, right? And a couple other fathers said, well, you know, actually, I kind of feel the same way. And so it was a really nice moment for the group and the cohesion of the group to know that they could be on differing sides of an issue like this. And I think to your original point that as far as it kind of hit me, and I don't know about Dom, but for me as a father, I... I don't know how I would have felt, right? I'm not a widowed parent, but I could see where he was coming from, right? And the truth is you can't replace what another parent does, mother or father, male or female. And even though our guys at first tried to do that and then some, there's just no way to make up for that. These father's kids went through a horrible thing and these men were there for their children in a way that I think became more apparent to them over time that they were not just doing good enough, but that good enough was plenty good enough and that they were connected and present with their kids and they don't have to be a replica of the mother they lost or to make up for that in any full way because she can. Yeah. It's a really interesting question though. And, you know, Sarah, we started with the widowed fathers group because that was where the clinical work led us. And then several years later, we started, and when I say we, I mean the University of North Carolina, I don't mean me and Justin, but we started a, a group for widowed moms. And I, we've never asked the widowed moms if any of them ever felt like the wrong parent died, because I'm sure for some of them, for some of the parents in either group, there was a division of labor and roles that you know may have resulted in someone feeling like, yeah, the other parent who was much more involved in the day-to-day parenting shouldn't have died, right? It's so hard to be a parent. It's even harder to be a single parent. It's even harder still to be a single parent who is simultaneously doing it alone, mourning their co-parent, helping their children mourn the loss of their parent. And so I wonder if some of it is just feeling so overwhelmed that you can't help but think somebody else, my spouse or my partner, might have done better than I'm doing. Yeah, I love the evolution from the dads being sort of perfectionist and wanting to get everything right and just like their wives. And then, you know, the sort of the evolution to the good enough. One of my favorite moments is when they were sharing tips, life hacks about how to get through the day. In a subsequent group, we had one dad who had, what was it, Justin? Was it five kids or six kids? I can't remember. But He was talking about how he was spending every evening making all of these sandwiches for school the next day. And one of the other dads just said, that's nuts. Why don't you get your oldest kid to make sandwiches at night? And that never occurred to him. It was like (laughs) a a eureka moment where I was like, oh, my gosh, I can have them chip in and not have to do everything. He came back the next month and said that his kids were now on the assembly line of making PBJs the night before. I love that. Yeah. 
So what made the group work? Justin mentioned a word earlier that I think is exactly right, and it's cohesion. We had one guy a few years ago who would walk in to the group, sit down and say, I need the wisdom of the group. (laughs) The whole was greater than the sum of the parts, and each of the men had a sense of ownership that they were responsible to the other guys. Gives you goosebumps on occasion when you see how they connect with each other and how good they are to each other, even when they're challenging some of the things they say. And how unexpected it is for most of them that the group is this valuable to them, right? For a lot of the guys, there's some hesitancy to joining a group of people you don't know and talking about the most personal and tragic thing you've ever experienced. And then when you do that, there might be a little bit of a cathartic experience in doing it. But then when you're received and you hear other people say things that you've been thinking but have not shared with anyone else, and then it works, it's like, not only does it work, and that's wonderful, but it really there's almost a surprise to it, at least initially, that it works and that you feel a connection with people who you didn't know an hour and a half earlier. No, it's validating. Um, it's really, yeah, oh, it's totally validating. When a father says something and we see a bunch of heads nod, that's when you know that you're getting ready to get into a good little stretch. There's another part of this, which is, I think, really important, which is that they don't have to explain to anyone else what they're doing there. And sometimes what some of the veterans in the group will say when a a person joins for the first time is kind of welcome to our shitty club. We're sorry (laughs) you're here. And so what's interesting about it is that they say things to each other and they talk about things with each other that they can't or won't talk about with anyone else. Some of the humor can get a little dark, but they all get it. Some of the, um, I wouldn't quite call them confessions, but it's close to that. Some of the disclosures about their thoughts and their feelings and so on, they wouldn't say to anyone else. That's one of the few places where they can talk about the ways in which their marriages weren't perfect, but without kind of feeling like you're saying something bad about your late wife. Yeah. And so it just, it gets real and there's a sense of it's safe here. Well, in your book and your videos, the men don't necessarily refer to themselves as support group people. (laughs) But in your work with men and fathers and families, have you seen extra barriers for the dads because their perceived notions of masculinity, either individually or as a culture? Yeah, I think that's certainly true. We don't have any data necessarily to support that, but I I think that's absolutely true true, right? That's kind of one of the sayings that one of the men said at the first group was, you know, I'm not a support group kind of guy. And we got a bunch of, I'm not, I'm not either. Yeah, you know, and, and so yeah, whether that plays in, it probably does play into masculinity or, you know, kind of whether or not men can be vulnerable and reach out for support like that. So I think there are some barriers in getting guys into the group or having men kind of take that leap into the group. Once they're in the group, the barriers are not an issue. Yeah. And I would add one other thing to that, which is I do believe that for most of the men who have joined up, the ticket in the door was they wanted to help their kids. They had a sense Mm -hmm. that their kids had been through this horrific experience and they didn't want to screw their kids up more, to quote one of the fathers, than they've already been screwed up by their mother dying. And so they were there in a sense, not for them, although ultimately it was for them, but they were thinking, I'm here for my kids. And I, quite honestly, I was thinking that as well. When we first mm-hmm. started this, the motivation for me was I knew just enough about early parental loss to know that if we could help the kids by helping the fathers, we'd be doing good. And along the way, it became reward enough to just see these men kind of heal and grieve and move on. But I absolutely have no doubt in my mind that for so many of these guys, the blow was lessened by their fathers getting help and also modeling for their kids that it's okay to go someplace, you know, once a month or once a week or whatever it is and talk about your feelings and get some help without dragging their kids and forcing them to get into therapy after they lost their moms. That's fantastic. You've done so much good. And I love how you reflect the evolution, the healing across the four years that they're together. It's really, really well done. Thank you. 
I want to talk about the really helpful context you share in the book about Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's five stages of grief. Her work was groundbreaking at the time. It mm-hmm. started a national conversation about death that we really needed to have. Yeah. But her stages of grief were broadened way beyond her initial writing. And I think it's important to talk about that because her stages really didn't work for the guys in your group. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it matches the grief experiences that many of us have. So I read on death and dying when I was in college. I'm older than Justin. And it was a remarkable book and it radically transformed the conversation about death and dying in this country. And I kind of went back and read it when we started doing this work many years later. And that book was based on interviews with people who were anticipating their own death, who were observed in conversation through a one-way mirror. There were about 250 subjects in that original book. The chapter on bargaining was all of like three pages long. And whether anticipating one's own death, if there are stages, whether those are the same kinds of processes that people go through who are mourning someone else's death is an open question. And I think on both counts, it's not quite right. I think that the stages of grief followed from a longstanding psychoanalytic tradition of kind of stage development, you know, oral, anal, genital development, you know, from Freud and so on. That was the way that people were thinking about how human growth and development goes, even in adulthood. And there's plenty of evidence for that in kids. But in this case, it actually, it wasn't based on a lot of data. And there was a group in uh, New Haven, Justin, remind me of who the lead um, author will come back to me. Holly Prigerson, I'm sorry. There we go. But they actually did a longitudinal study trying to validate these stages. And there was some validation, but the important point is that People don't go through these stages in a linear fashion. And in fact, the data that have been gathered over many years, in my estimate of the literature, is much more supportive of this dual process model of grief that's more dynamic, oscillating. You end up looking backwards and doing loss-related grief work, and you have to look forward to do adaptation-related work And you oscillate between those with occasional pauses so you can catch a ball game or a movie or whatever you need to do to clear your head. But that over time, that oscillation attenuates. It never really stops. You're never really over grief. And it certainly doesn't take just six months. Okay? It takes longer for most people, for sure. I'll say when we talk with the guys in the group about the five stages and or talk to them about the dual process model. I think in our hundred plus fathers, we've never had one that says, you know what? The stage theory still really resonates with me. What we do hear a lot of is that the dual process model does resonate. It does capture the looking back and the moving forward and the whipsaw between the two. And it also, the dual process model does not assign emotions or feelings, right? Because by naming five things, you know, bargaining, acceptance, that almost implies that there's just five things, right? And then it's really, I think, easy to say, well, I also feel anxious. I also feel relief. I also feel all these other things that are anywhere captured in those five stages, much less not in a sequential order. Yeah, I agree. The grief kind of encompasses every emotion on the wheel. There's really no putting it into those boxes. We've had a couple of dads who've mentioned or at least alluded to that they've tried to align their experiences with the five stages and it's felt like putting a circle into a square hole, right? A hundred percent. And the thought can be, am I doing grief wrong? Because I'm not doing it like this or like this model. And of course they're not doing grief wrong, but no one knows how to do grief when they hit them like this for the first time. Right. It is also true that even though I agree completely that the dual process model is less pathologizing. It is also true, though, that the authors of the dual process model, Strobe and Shoot, know, I think very accurately, that if you get stuck in one domain or the other, if all of your effort is in looking back and you're not making adaptations to moving forward and adapting, um, that's a problem. Or if you are so forward thinking 
that you never spend time allowing yourself to feel the loss of who you had and what you had and what your family was like, then that's problematic too. And I do think that that was a challenge for a lot of the men has been over the years because from day one after they bury their wives, these men have to get their kids up in the morning, get them dressed, go to school, keep a job, do all of those things. It's very forward looking. And one of the more poignant moments that we have frequently in in the group is when they're together and they allow themselves to kind of sit in that space of this is really terrible. I really, really miss her. And I get in bed at night and the person that I most want to talk about, how am I going to deal with this is not there. Those are the kinds of things they share with each other. And so they allow themselves to get into that kind of loss oriented mentality that's described in the dual process model. I remember at one point, one of them was dating and the woman walked in and there was a shrine to the wife on the piano or something. And she was like, I think it's time to get rid of that. (laughs) How do you know if you're stuck in your grief? I think, you know, if you're stuck in your grief, really, are you not tending to things that you need to do? Are you not looking forward? Can you not kind of envision a future that feels meaningful or, you know, even kind of the opposite where you're stuck in bed and you're having more days than not that you call off sick from work or don't tend to your kind of life responsibilities because you're just kind of stuck in thought and stuck in grief. And it's really helpful sometimes to look through a photo album and shed some tears. If you're doing that every day for weeks and months on end, that's probably not helpful. I don't know if that's a very descriptive answer, Don. You probably have a better one. I don't know if I have a better one, but I'm a psychiatrist by training and the critical variable for kind of when you get to a place where you say, yeah, this is a problem that needs some clinical attention is just what Justin was saying. It's kind of a functional assessment. If you can't go to work, if you can't get through the day, if you're not getting out of bed, if you're not getting dressed, if you can't get through a conversation with someone without bursting into tears. Now, all of that is very normal in the first kind of period of time after something profound happens to you. And even though I'm not a believer in hard and fast timelines, if you're still there a year after, a year and a half, two years after, if you're just not moving on in various ways and the degree of pain and suffering is such that it's interfering with core parts of your life, then you're probably stuck in grief. And there's no question that a percentage of patients, a small percentage, will have some version of a prolonged grief, a complicated grief, some difficulty moving on that may require kind of specific psychological intervention or sometimes medications. If you can't sleep at all, if you're not eating, if you're losing a lot of weight, it's really about kind of how it's going after a certain period of time, not days and weeks, but months and years, I would say. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, these dads are not only navigating their own grief, but they're also navigating their kids' grief. Mm -hmm. And parenting kids who are grieving, they aren't always on the same timeline or roadmap, and they had to kind of muddle through their parenting. (laughs) Their kids, you know, weren't sitting down with them and having an open conversation, especially the teenagers, a tidy conversation about their grief. So... uh, to your point, these fathers were faced with three primary tasks the moment after they lost their wives, and or a task, but primary areas to tend to, and that's their own grief, their children's grief, and then just simply keeping the trains moving at home and all that. And those are all present and pressing on day one. When we talk about children, it really depends if we're talking about a five-year-old, a 10-year-old, or a 17-year-old, right? And that cognitive understanding of what they've lost and whether or not they think mom can come back or whether they understand that it's permanent and magical thinking happens at earlier ages. So it really depends a lot on the child's age. And we've had some fathers who have had children at different ages. And so it really means having to have some understanding of how children grieve at 5, 10, and 12. You know, certainly we hear 
we have fathers who tell us that their children are clearly struggling, right? They're struggling, their grades are affected, their sleep is affected, they don't want to hang out with their friends as much, they can't or won't talk about mom, or if they do, they burst out and crying, and this happens for months and months or years. But then we hear a lot of fathers who say that their kids, quote unquote, look okay at first, right? And they seem like they're doing all right. They're going to school, their grades seem okay. And these fathers, I think, struggle with whether or not their kids are, quote unquote, okay, or whether they're kind of masking something. And then we see this a lot. They are kind of doing okay in the moment, but that doesn't mean that's predictive of how they're going to do necessarily in the future. And we hear a lot about fathers who say their kids look great and do okay. And then at some point down the road, Mm -hmm. the bottom seems to kind of fall out and it all comes Mm -hmm. tumbling out. And whether that's a kind of a delayed grief or whether the children reach a different developmental or maturity level. And so they understand it differently or they're in a new classroom and their kids, they have now have friends who don't know their mom died. And so they're asking about my, whatever the changes that are, we see that a lot, kind of a delayed grief response. And so we'll talk to the men about being not on the lookout for that, but being aware that that's a possibility. It doesn't mean they need to be suspect when their kids appear to be doing well, but it is a heads up that not only does everyone's grief not follow a linear pattern, but children's often are even kind of more up and down than adults. So it's almost like you've got the dual process, but you've also got the age developmental stages on top of that. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely right. And we, you know, we've had certain fathers whose children have been very, you know, two or three years old when they've lost their mom. And so where's mom and having to repeat the explanation of some form of why mom's not here. And then that children gets old enough to have a different explanation. And then that children gets to be eight or nine and needs another talk about it. And then everyone has their parents at their high school graduation. And that's another kind of, so the developmental milestones that kids, you know, as a parent seem like they blow through, sometimes the understanding of and reaction to grief can take twists and turns along the same way. Yeah, there was a really poignant moment in the book when, and I'm not remembering the dad's name, but the son came and wanted to know every detail. And it was a three-hour conversation about every detail of mom's illness and dying. And it really shifted the conversation. So that deep, intimate sort of, here's what happened, was really important for that kid. It was very important. And so that, just real quickly, that was Neil. And his son was about maybe 12, I think, at the time. And Neil had noticed that his son had been more irritable and kind of short with him. And eventually Neil called him on it. And the son lit it out and said he was mad. And Neil assumed he was mad that his mom had died. And they were finally talking about it a year and a half later. But really, the kid said, Dad, I'm mad at you because you didn't let me come into the hospital and see mom before she died. And Neil had not explained, the kid didn't understand that his mom's death was rather sudden, that they didn't allow children in the ICU, and that there was some confusion around really how that went down. And this kid had been bottling this up for 18 months. And it came out in a burst, and it came out in a messy fashion, but Neil had the wherewithal to push the pause button, sit down with his kid, and spend the next two hours beginning to hash some of this out. And he said he noticed a change in his son after that. Not that yeah. this isn't a fairy tale. Things weren't all better. But that was a, a shift. that was an inflection point that yeah. things shifted after that. And so that's a, a great example of how this can go with kids. And it's 18 months later, and we're having a conversation that Neil didn't know there was any conversation needed to be had. But this child, who was 10 when his mom died, had not been told or didn't appreciate the circumstances around her death. Yeah. One of the things that I spend a lot of time thinking about is the difference between being negatively affected by an event in your life and shaped by it. And obviously, Mm -hmm. the loss of a parent when you're a child is a profound event. And it's impossible for me to imagine someone not being shaped, at the very least, by that in the same way or in a maybe a greater way than we're shaped by all sorts of things that happen. You know, when if you move at a certain time and you lose some friends or if you don't make a sports team or if you've got unrequited love in high school, there are all sorts of things that will shape your life in various ways. 
Certainly the loss of a parent will do that. What's interesting to me is to think about kind of where along the loss pathology spectrum that is. In other words, I think most of these kids are going to do fine. They're going to be changed for sure because of what they've been through. It doesn't mean they're going to be harmed. Now, there are some data that are coming out, longer-term follow-up studies that look at what are called ACEs, adverse childhood experiences. So poverty, physical abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse, all sorts of bad things that shouldn't happen to kids. By any definition, loss of a parent when you're a child is an ACE. It's an adverse childhood event. And there are some studies that suggest that adults who have lost a parent in childhood have increased mortality compared to adults who have not lost a parent in childhood. And so, you know, there may be some psychological, physiological, biological, mortality-related consequences when you look across an entire population where you see a signal. What that means for any particular family is, you know, is not so clear. There's a difference between individualized outcomes and population outcomes, and we have that in all of medicine and public health. But it is an interesting question as to whether kind of it is a shaping influence or a deleterious influence, you know, depending on how you kind of define it. Thank you for sharing that. To pick up the parenting thread, what advice would you give after all of the stories you've heard? And some couples were passing the baton. You use a great metaphor about the relay race. What advice would you give since you are still in a cancer hospital, still serving cancer patients who will presumably die and leave a parent, a, you know, a solo parent. What advice would you give on passing the baton? It's hard to overstate how working with widowed parents has really shaped our work with those who have cancer, right? Especially parents who have cancer. And it, it's somewhat been intentional on our part is to learn from the widowed parents to say, you know, basically, what would you have done differently? What did you do that worked for you, right? That wasn't why we started the support group. But it's something that we have focused on since then is learning from the widowed men and women now to inform our understanding of how to treat parents with cancer. And so we do a lot of that here at UNC. In fact, uh, we just started a clinic early this year called the Parenting with Cancer Clinic, where the focus is partly just that. How do you communicate with your children about your cancer and about your prognosis and treatment and all that. And the other part of the clinic is we have a, a colleague who is a lawyer and she meets with the parents to discuss estate planning, wills, custody issues when they come up. And those issues turn out to be really, really important when you have cancer and when you have children. And to have those discussions earlier and not later can make the world a difference. And so that's our clinic. Those are the dual focuses of our clinic. But to your point, when I meet with a parent in that clinic who has a questionable or poor prognosis, a lot of times, and we encourage this, they'll bring, you know, his or her spouse or partner with them. And I will not infrequently, if and when it's appropriate, mention our widowed parent program and mention what we've learned and what discussions that they can have now what legacy building activities they can do with their children now, what things that can be said now that may not be able to be said later, but are really important. What are some of those things? And not everyone I meet is ready for that, right? Not everyone I meet is in a position to have that conversation. And part of our job is to gauge that. But for those who are, for those who are in a place that uh, appreciate their prognosis and appreciate that their son or daughter is gonna be left with mom or dad, helping them anticipate what life will be like for the surviving parent. And I feel like we can do that pretty well based on our work with widowed parents. That can go a long way and it can go a long way in helping to at least think about passing that baton and what that might include. Again, this is, I don't mention this, this doesn't come up with everyone I see. It has to be the right timing. You know, we, we still hear from a lot of our dads that they or their wives or their partners did not 
do things or say things that they wish they would have done or have said. And you can't get back that time. There's a window there that closes and you can't go back and open it. And so working with families to help them anticipate what are some conversations, what are some things to do now to help for the future is central part of our work with parents with cancer. The last point is so important. And this is more in the realm of anecdotes than hard science. But what our experience has been is that when the dying parent has candid conversations with their co-parent about things that matter to them, about what they think, you know, thing. I mean, we had one, we had one guy in the group whose wife actually listed out things to do, including kind of dating again at some point and finding love again at some point. And there are other fathers who never had anything close to a conversation like that with their spouses and felt like they were wondering, guessing, wishing that they had known. So I imagine my kids are now older and grown and out of the house, but I imagine that if I had a life-threatening illness when my kids were little, knowing what I know now, I would have said to my wife all sorts of stuff about how I felt about she could do anything she wants after I died, obviously. But, you know, what I would, you know, what mattered to me, what was important and what were some of the values and so on. So that would be one thing that I would just add to what Justin said and emphasize it. And the second thing that I think is really important is that we have heard through multiple formal studies that we've done asking parents about what's most important to them, parents who have advanced cancer, parents who lost a co-parent, and it's conversations with healthcare teams. Mm. Being a parent is a huge part of people's identities. And it's often not discussed at all when it comes to medical decision-making. Maybe it's thought to be too personal or whatever, but it seems to me that one piece of advice I would have for a parent with a serious illness, not just cancer, any serious illness, is to talk with their doctors and nurses and people taking care of them about their role as a parent and why that's important to them and how that might inform some of their decisions. Because one of the things that is absolutely tragedy on top of tragedy is when end of life decision making does not take into account those core values and people don't get a chance to say goodbye to their kids and they don't get a chance to kind of do whatever it is that's important to them that they want to do because it's kind of been left not discussed. I really relate to that. Is that right? I lost my mother as an adult. She had cancer and was swept up in medical treatments and we really didn't get to talk about what she wanted at the end or how to make it happen. So here I am creating a podcast and one of the missions of this podcast is actually hopefully to provide a door or window into some of those conversations. So maybe they could listen to the two of you in this episode mm -hmm. and it might spark a conversation, you know, with the parents. I would add one, just one quick thing to that is that it's really easy to put off these kind of conversations. It's really easy to think you have more time. And one of the fathers in that first group, Carl said it succinctly and beautifully why he and his wife never really had these conversations. And he said, it got to be too late before he realized it was too late. And she was cognitively impaired because of the metastatic breast cancer in her brain. And they never had that. He knew they needed to. He knew that they would. And they never did. So that window closed, but he didn't know it was closed until it was already closed. There is a project that we are in the midst of right now that we're very excited about. And this is a project that was led by a colleague named Lisa Park, a physician who worked with us here at UNC. And it is a online resource for parents who have cancer at any stage and who have kids at home. And it's intended to facilitate these kinds of conversations that we've been talking about. So what happens is we ask a bunch of questions about who the parent is, what kind of 
cancer they have, what kind of prognosis they have, what's their understanding of it. And then we ask questions about their kids, how many kids they have and how old are they and which kid are they most worried about. And then essentially it involves a lot of recommended template text language where they could talk about kind of, you know, how they answer a question. You know, what do you say if your kid says, mommy, are you going to die? And you don't have to use that language. You can use your own. You can kind of substitute any or all of the recommended language, but it's meant to be a developmentally designed facilitator of difficult conversations so that you feel prepared for having those conversations, given how difficult it is. Fantastic. Thank you. That should be up and running sometime in the next six months, we're hoping. I, yeah, I we're, we're just analyzing the data, but the early returns show that parents find it helpful and that yes. it increases, facilitates communication with their children around these kind of issues. Fantastic. And so the idea is if someone's seen here at UNC, where we are, then they can see me or Donald or colleagues. But a lot of folks are getting their cancer care at places that don't have psychosocial professionals and don't have people who can initiate these kind of discussions. And the idea is they can go on this website, fill in their information and get as personalized feedback as you can get, which we think is going to be a real step up from more general websites that cannot be as personalized as what we're going to be launching soon enough. Yeah. And I feel like yours is science-based as well from your experience and in, in your yeah. practice. Yeah. I love that your book is short, but I wanted it to be longer. So there you go. I want, I want more. Well, we'll take that as a compliment. Yeah. We kept it short intentionally. We wanted it to be a book that people finished. Oh, we should also mention that any proceeds and royalties from the book do not go into either Don or my pockets. It goes all back into the program. You know, we didn't want to profit off this story, and the fathers were generous enough to let us write about them, let us take their picture for the book, and share their stories. You told their stories well, and they clearly were comfortable. The group photo there is really lovely. So did you say you're allowing widows as well as widowers in your group now? Or is it all still men? We have separate groups. Actually, Don and I run two groups for men, and then a colleague okay. of ours runs uh, one for women. And we have asked every now and then we loop back and ask the guys, and our colleague will ask the women, you know, do we want to you know, mix? Do we need to keep this segregated by gender? And every time the answer is yes, please keep it as is. Um, the men feel comfortable with men, and I think the women are the same way. And do I think it worked fine if we blended the genders? I think probably so. Well, clearly you've actually created such a safe space. I mean, that's a talent that not everyone has to be able to create that safety for people to share. So Appreciate that's that. a gift. Thank you. That's a gift. Okay, well, my last question which is the question I ask all of my interviewees. What does a peaceful exit mean to you? I'm going to go first before I start crying. So it just so happens that I got back from Chicago a day and a half ago after being there for 10 days. My father is now 96 and he's at home hospice. And so I've been thinking a lot about that for him and then by extension for me. And... For me, it is reasonably comfortable, dignified, and surrounded by family. That's what I'm working really hard to do for my dad, which is to avoid the kind of um, intense, highly technical end of life that I see too often every day when I do consultations in the hospital. He's 96. We, it's very clear that he is not going back into the hospital. And I think that we have set up, I hope that my siblings and I have set up a exit ramp where he can die at home with his wife of 68 years, comfortable. And when, you know, when the time comes without us doing anything, he's my hero and I love the guy. And and even though he's a shadow of his former self, the grace that he is demonstrating to us blows my mind. So 
for me, that's, that's what it means this week anyway, to ask me in two weeks or a month or whatever. Thank you. Yeah. How are you, Justin? What does a peaceful exit mean to you? Oh, gosh. For your life. For me, for my life. And I'm used to one being the therapist. Uh, no, um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think a peaceful exit for me would mean that, um, that I've done right in the world, that I've not lived anything close to a perfect life, but that I've added more good than I've taken from this planet or from the people in my orbit and um, that I've left some kind of legacy, at least for the people who knew me and that those friends and family who I love know that I love them. Well, I don't know you well, but I think you both have left an amazing legacy <laughs> already. So thank you so much for your time. Very and kind And for your of amazing you. book. Thank you. Hey, Sarah, thank you for reading it so carefully. Yeah. It's, it's very clear that you digested it. Everybody who writes a book wants somebody to read it and actually, you know, take it in. You clearly did. And that's really nice. Thanks. Yes, I learned a lot and I will pass it on. We appreciate that. Thank you for listening to Peaceful Exit. I'm your host, Sarah Kavanaugh. You can learn more about this podcast at peacefulexit.net. And you can find me on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram at A Peaceful Exit. If you enjoyed this episode, please let us know. You can rate and review this show on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. This episode was produced by the amazing team at Large Media. You can find them at larjmedia.com. The Peaceful Exit team includes my producer, Katie Klein, and editor, Kareen Kiltow. Our sound engineer is Sean Simmons. Tina Knoll is our senior producer, and Sid Gladu provides additional production and social media support. Special thanks to Ricardo Russell for the original music throughout this podcast. As always, thanks for listening. I'm Sarah Kavanaugh, and this is Peaceful Exit. <laughs>